Hi, I'm Paul Levy, and uh, my privilege today is to uh, introduce. And my privilege today is to introduce Nicola Tilly, uh, whom I follow in, uh, in I know from the New Yorker, uh, NewYorker.com, uh, which I follow religiously, as I'm sure everybody in the room does. Um, she's Nicola is the author of the of the blog Edible Geography. And she's co-director of Studio XNYC, which is part of the Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation's global network of advanced research laboratories for exploring the future of cities. She's curator of a forthcoming exhibition at the Center for Land Use Interpretation, exploring North America's Spaces of Artificial Refrigeration, and co-founder of the Food Print Project. In June 2012, Future Plural, the curatorial and publishing initiative that Nicola co-directs, launched a venue, a pop-up interview studio, and mobile media rig traveling around North America through September 2000 and 13. Nicola, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, if uh, I had been lucky enough to come here in 2013, that would actually have been my bio. But things have moved on a little since then, so it's not completely up to date. I'm no longer at Columbia, Studio X actually no longer exists. I do write for The New Yorker. Um, I now make a podcast called Gastropod, which is a food through the lens of history and science. And my refrigeration exhibition, which was forthcoming back then, is, uh, has come and gone and now turned into a forthcoming book. So um, uh, that's the progress in the past couple of years. Meanwhile, um, and it is, I wish I could have been here in 2013. I've been wanting to come to the Oxford Symposium since I first heard about it, and I think 2006 or something like that. So, and it's an incredible honor to be here, both for my first time and presenting. So, uh, what I'm gonna talk to you about is a project that began, as so many good things do, with Harold McGee. Um, and in particular, this very felicitous uh, phrase in the section of his book that deals with egg foams. So um, obviously to read Harold McGee is to fall in love with uh, egg foams. Uh, one of the things that egg foams are, make egg foams amazing is that it's one of the few instances where agitation creates structure rather than destroying it. Um, but he also sort of wrote this sentence that egg foams offer us this way to harvest the air and make it an integral part of meringues, of mousses, of gin fizzes, of souffles. And, uh, and really, it's not just, it, it's a wonderfully poetic phrase, but it's not just a rhetorical flourish because as McGee writes, as your meringue uh, batter reaches the stiff peak stage, it's approaching 90% air. Um, so a friend and collaborator of mine called Zach Denfeld uh, read this paragraph um, in 2011, and at the time he was teaching in Bangalore. Zach is co-founder of something called the Center for Genomic Gastronomy, and if you haven't heard of it, uh, I, I can guarantee you're in for some really uh, fascinating Googling this afternoon, um, definitely look it up. But he's, a, he's an artist uh, working with food, um, with the Center for Genomic Gastronomy. He was living in Bangalore, and the air quality in Bangalore, it's, it's not the worst in India, but it's not the greatest either. And Zach also noticed, well, it's better in some areas and worse in others. And so he gave his students some homework. Um, they were to go out to their street corner or onto the roof of their building armed with a mixing bowl, a whisk, some egg whites, some sugar, 
and whip it. And, and then they were to put that in their oven and then they were to mail the resulting meringues to their local politician. So as, as Zach wrote at the time, you know, the tragedy of the commons never tasted so good. And it was a, it was a, a, a really sort of thought-provoking project for students. There was some sort of uh, interesting dialogues with the politicians, uh, not wanting to eat the meringues, etc. <laughs> And I thought, well, this is a fabulous idea, but it has its limitations. So, uh, you know, yes, in Bangalore, you can compare meringues from different parts of the city, but what if you wanted to eat Los Angeles side by side with Beijing? You know, other than some, short of some sort of amazing overnight FedExing situation, um, that's not gonna happen. So then I started wondering, well, you know, scientists, they often have ways of recreating things in the lab. All across America, actually with the venue project, I visited a lot of these, there are fun-sized volcanoes and lightning storms and earthquakes and guts and, and things where scientists make a small version to understand it in the lab. And so I thought, well, maybe uh, that exists for smog too, and I found it at the University of California, Riverside. The Bournes College of Engineering there is home to the largest smog chambers in the world. And uh, actually, if you uh, think about it for a second, that's not surprising because Riverside is sort of a town immediately um, east of Los Angeles, but up against the hill. So it, again, it's sort of just downwind, really. And it just gathers all of LA's smog. Um, and so, actually, I looked into sort of why Riverside came to have this expertise, and it, it, it involves a flavor chemist called Ari Hagen Schmidt. So, uh, pre-war, Ari Hagen Schmidt was renowned for his fruit flavors. He was the master of pineapple, apparently, very tricky flavor to get right at the time. Um, <laughs> Post-war, um, he's you know. He's there in Riverside, and the inhabitants, who at the time were mostly farmers, are starting to complain of smog damage to their crops, the rubber in their tires is cracking, their eyes are weeping and itchy and painful. And Ari Hagen-Smith decided to turn his attention to what he called a super flavor problem, the flavor of Los Angeles. So, he had noticed that um, the flavor of Los Angeles was not like the flavor of a smog in his native Holland, which is this more sort of sulfurous coal-fired uh, smog. In LA, he was detecting, and remember, he's a flavor scientist, so he's detecting sort of a chlorine-y, bleachy note. And so he decided to analyze the flavor chemistry of the smog. Um, so he used the exact same setup as for his pineapple work, um, these sort of series of freeze-out traps that just basically kind of condense the, uh, the volatile aromatic chemicals into a few drops of a liquid that you can analyze with your chemical instruments. Um, so when he put the air of Los Angeles into his sort of freeze-out traps, uh, the result was just a, a couple of drops of this dark brown kind of poisonous smelling liquid. <laughs> <laughs> then he analyzed, and that gave him the clue he needed. He found oxygenated organic molecules in there, and he was able to say, well, that means that LA's very distinctive smog, it's ozone, not sulfur, and that was the clue he needed to track down the culprit, which was the fact that all these partially combusted hydrocarbons from all the cars on the new freeways they were being oxidized in the beautiful Southern California sunshine and being turned into ozone. So with this first discovery, Ari Hagen-Schmidt, the flavor scientist, became the father of smog science, basically. Uh, he became the first chair of the California Air Resources Board, um, which sets the emission standards for California and has tried with varying degrees of success to keep control of smog in, in Southern California ever since. 
Um, and to, oh, I should say, to, to develop it, uh, to study uh, uh, this um, smog phenomenon, he built something called the smog chamber. So this is one of them. Uh, I'm standing inside it to take this photo. Basically, the idea is you can recreate smog in a controlled environment, and then you can, that enables you to sort of unpack the series of reactions that create smog and understand what varying the levels of chemicals does and all of these sorts of things. So the smog forms, whereas this is inside a, a sort of slightly deflated Teflon bag. Um, there are mirrored walls and this sort of bluish light all around to simulate the atmosphere. This is an inflated smog chamber. It's actually filled with air not smog because they were testing it for holes, but um, you can see the mirrors and the banks of light more clearly. Um, and this is where they inject all the chemicals, the precursor chemicals that then react in the bag to form the smog. Because, you know, car exhaust on its own is not smog. Smog is a many splendid thing. It's, uh, it's the partially combusted hydrocarbons, yes, but it's also nitrogen oxides from the car, it's emissions from the container ships at Long Beach, it's dust, it's particulate matter, it's forest fires. It's a little bit of all of these things combining with uh, the water in the atmosphere and the UV light and forming smog. So to recreate, to my mind, is actually a bit like cooking you sort of have to reverse engineer sort of the dish of smog, develop an ingredient list, uh, pump them all in, and then bake for a certain amount of time under UV lamps. And then you have smog. So uh, armed with this information, we, uh, Zach and I, uh, and his colleagues at the Center for Genomic Gastronomy, we decided to build our own smog synthesizer. So in this picture, you see those four little chambers. Those are for the precursor ingredients. Um, we pumped them into the main mirrored chamber on top using bicycle pumps, little, little bit Heath Robinson. Um, and we, uh, we had a UV sort of setup that we put on top. And inside our meringue whipping apparatus, my favorite part is that we obviously we had to build in gloves to be able to to whip the meringues, but we couldn't find gloves that were long enough um, until we went to a sex shop. And so the, <laughs> the gloves in there are these rather vampy, like PVC above the elbow, um, dominatrix gloves that actually have recently had to be replaced because the PVC was cracking and flaking off, which, as you'll remember, rubber cracking is a sign of uh, smog damage, so we, we are indeed making the real thing. Um, so I've introduced you to a couple of types of smog already. There's this sulfur-based sort of pea super style, um, that you get, uh, and, and then there's the, the ozone, sort of LA style. And actually, atmospheric scientists cl do classify smogs into sort of major types based on the precursor chemicals and the sort of prevailing atmospheric conditions. So you do get, you get these pea super style, that's coal burning, it's typically a damp or moist, humid climate. Uh, 1950s London is the classic example. Beijing is where you could sample this today, should you be so inclined. Um, it tastes eggy, it tastes gritty, it leaves your mouth feeling very, very dirty. Um, 1950s, 60s LA, that's a photochemical smog. Um, if you would like to sample that today, the best place is probably Mexico City. Um, it's just this distinctive note, uh, note that Hagen Schmidt noticed of sort of cleaning fluids. Um, there's another type, the Atlanta style smog. And that's like an LA style, but in Atlanta, because there's so many sort of pine trees and green things de decaying, there's sort of 10% of their emissions are something called terpenes, which uh, sort of contribute to the photochemical smog, but also give it this sort of um, mulchy note. And, uh, and then there's an agricultural smog. That's a very distinctive smog. It's very unusual for smogs in that it's alkaline rather than acidic. And it's from sort of the ammonia and the amines from livestock uh, holdings and manure lagoons and so on. 
Um, it's what gives the Central Valley of California the worst air quality in the US. It tastes of ammonia with a fishy note. And, uh, and so in the lab, you know, scientists will, you know, inject these chemicals directly using their nozzles. Uh, it's actually remarkably hard to order amines and <laughs> nitrogen oxides on Amazon. They don't have everything yet. So the scientists at the University of California, Riverside, helped us develop these um, at-home recipes uh, that we could do. So for example, we had uh, orange peel and pine needles for the terpenes. Uh, we made our own NOx nitrogen oxides using a uh, copper wire dissolved in concentrated nitric acid. Um, I left a fish to rot on my balcony in Brooklyn for several days, uh, may have been a week, to generate an appropriate quantity of amines. Um, I hand harvested the particulate matter from my own roof deck. Um, conveniently, I happened to live basically on top of one of Robert Moses' freeways, the BQE. So I had this perfect supply of artisanal hand harvested uh, particulate matter. Um, and when we pumped all of those precursors into our chamber, we made our own private smogs. And I tell you, nothing compares to the feeling of your first smog. <laughs> uh, um, this, is my friend, uh, this is my friend Laura in my flat in Brooklyn. Um, she is making meringues in the smog chamber. Based on this experience, I would say probably don't try this at home. <laughs> Um, I still owe everyone in my building a giant apology. Um, but anyway, we, we made meringues and we served them as part of the New Museum's annual street festival in New York City. And what was amazing is the organizers of this event put us next to the, uh, the um, uh, food vendors rather than with all the other artists and designers. <laughs> So we're next to this, you know, hipster um, Vietnamese sandwich shop and artisanal um, popsicles on the other side, and we are serving smog meringues. I'd, and I would like to point out, notice who has the longer queue there. It did help that we weren't charging. Free is <laughs> always attractive. But I know, I mean, I'm the, obviously, uh, I'm laughing about this, and in some ways it might seem like, oh, this is quite a frivolous sort of art project, but we actually had quite a serious goal. Um, a smog meringue, you know, the way we thought about it was as a Trojan treat. So you could transform this sort of largely unconscious process of breathing into something that was more conscious, the more conscious act of eating. And, and our hope was sort of in making that shift that we could make people think about something that is mostly invisible, but actually an increasingly serious problem in the stats. I mean, I, I, I think of myself as a reasonably well-informed individual, and I had no idea until we started working on this project, but outdoor air pollution has gone up 8% globally in just the past five years, to the point where the World Health Organization now says it's the number one cause of preventable death in the world. It's overtaken tobacco, it's overtaken road accidents, it's overtaken war, it's the main thing that is killing people that doesn't need to be killing them. It causes heart disease, it causes lung disease, it's also linked to dementia and Alzheimer's, and of course, it's another of those things where it's, there are enormous inequities, where uh, poor air is concentrated in poorer areas and often in the developing world. So, but, but as a problem, it's largely invisible. I mean, yes, on the worst days in Beijing, you can see the smog. In fact, the smog is all you can see on those days. But day to day, for most of us, you're not thinking air pollution, it's such a massive problem. Um, we don't realize it's there, and it is. I mean, here in the UK, uh, 50,000 premature deaths a year attributed to diseases caused by air pollution. Uh, public health costs an estimated 20 billion pounds a year. Uh, this year, so in 2017, 
Um, in the first five days of the year, most of London exceeded its air pollution uh, sort of limits for the entire year. So uh, it really is a problem. And the goal with our, with our smog meringues was to say, well, here's this very visceral sort of interaction with air pollution that hopefully makes you think. Most people, um, you know, people have to breathe. Eating is sort of a choice. So that shift is quite powerful. The most frequently asked question is, is this safe to eat? And <laughs> I should say we didn't have liability insurance. <clears throat> uh, our answer was, I mean, is it safe to breathe? Uh, and of course, people would then think about it and did they want to put this in their bodies and there was a conversation is this what we're putting in our bodies anyway and why and what's in it and what what does it do etc etc and I ended up feeling really when we discussed the flavor notes of the smog meringue we're just giving people sort of a, a, a framework they're now going to think about the smell and taste of their air and wake up to the fact that, that often that taste is due to the ingredients that they are adding to it. We are adding to it. So the smog meringue is sort of a provocation. We've taken it to Paris climate talks. We took it to the World Health Organization, We've taken it to museums and festivals around the world. I actually just checked. I thought it was in Dublin at the moment, but it's in the Netherlands on display at the moment. So if you're heading there, you'll be able to see it. That's uh, why I'm not able to serve you smog meringues this morning which some of you may feel is a lucky escape. Um, but, but once we started uh, thinking this way, we thought, you know, we, here we are thinking about the different flavors of air in, for, in terms of smog, and we realized, you know, this, these smog meringues, they're just the tip of the iceberg. If we can actually taste a place in the form of atmosphere, you know, well, isn't, are we talking now about air war? <laughs> and if we're talking about air war, how would thinking about air war and tasting air war, how would that change our relationship with the atmosphere? So air war is obviously a neologism. I, uh, I first said it in 2015. I haven't found it anywhere else. Um, I'm sure uh, someone must have come up with it first. <laughs> Great. So there we go. It seems as though it might be a useful one. Um, for those of you who uh, have had the good fortune of either reading Tom Parker's book or being in his talk yesterday, you'll know that the concept of terroir is this very long and complex and fascinating one and that, you know, it's been used to construct identity, to unify, to divide, to denigrate, to elevate, and, of course, most recently, you know, to talk about how food, first wine, now basically everything, can express sort of the physical and social environment in which it's grown and produced through its distinctive flavor profile. And then in 2003, uh, some, a food writer and an oyster promoter coined the term meroir to talk about oysters. So erroir seemed to me to be the obvious next step. And I know people might be thinking, well, Terroir is supposed to be the complete environment in which a food is produced. So why do you need a new word for, you know, including the climate and so on? So why do you need a new word for just these kind of this idea of the flavors imparted by atmosphere? And obviously that is a very good question. Um, and my only defense of terroir is just if it enables you to sort of ask interesting questions and act as a framework for sort of thinking differently, hey, maybe it's worth it. So uh, we carried on exploring this idea of Erwar, and we got a commission from the Headland Center uh, for the Arts uh, to create a multi-course Erwar tasting menu. So we could start exploring some of these ideas. Uh, we continued our research um, by, uh, we started looking into fog, for example. We were in the Bay Area, the Headland Center for, for the Arts is in the, um, is in the Marin Headlands of the Bay Area, uh, and San Francisco is famous for its fog. The fog is so famous it even has a Twitter account of its own. But the fog actually by the 1980s had become more acidic than acid rain, 
On its worst days, it was more acidic than toilet bowl cleaner. Um, so we made a, sort of a, a sort of metaphorical translation of that idea with a cabbage soup. Um, and when you added an acidic foam to it, you changed the pH, which changed the color of the soup. We made welcome cocktails with water we had harvested from the fog, um, and also laced lichen, which is, I learned, the California state lichen, but also an indicator species that uh, changes color when the pH changes. Um, we looked into dust, uh, so uh, we scientists have sort of been, um, oh, that's, that's our lace lichen. Uh, we looked into dust, so scientists have been mapping these kind of giant atmospheric dust rivers that circumnavigate the, the globe, and they'll sort of spice the air we breathe with insect wings or Saharan dust, things like that. So we made a dust bowl uh, starter. Uh, it's filled with dried mushroom powder, for sort of representative of all the spores that are circulating. Seeds, bits of crickets, coconut ash, all sorts of things in there. And when you shattered it, it fell onto um, these uh, Saharan and Gobi uh, flavored schmears. Um, because a large chunk of actually what's circulating is dust from the Saharan and Gobi deserts. And then you could scoop that up with the shattered cracker. Um, we did some microbial mapping. So we had sourdough uh, from three different areas in, uh, in the Bay Area um, to sort of try and get a taste of the aerial microbiome. Coincidentally, I come here from Belgium where I was just at a giant experiment to determine how much of sourdough's flavor actually comes from the aerial microbiome as opposed to the baker. <sighs> or the microbes that are on the flower or the water. So there will finally be an answer to that question in November, and you have to listen to my podcast to find it. Um, <laughs> I went to Mexico City to do some research. I met a scientist called Robin Hudson at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and she had found that smog radically changes the flavor of food because it reduces the sensitivity of your sense of smell, but also your trigeminal receptors, which are the ones that sense chili or menthol or things like that. And so her research now focuses on working with street vendors, street food vendors in Mexico City. Um, you know, there are these hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children at the busiest intersections of all of the streets in Mexico City selling tortas and tamales and tacos. And there, the air pollution levels, obviously, where they are, are off the charts. So she's doing this very important work into sort of their sense of smell and so on. For us, that research made us wonder, well, is street food so sort of spicy and boldly flavored to compensate for the dampening effect of, of the aurora in which it is served? You know, and do you sort of, is, is that hot sauce you put on your taco, is that a sort of anti-smog seasoning? Um, you know, is Erwar the missing ingredient that means that when you have a taco at home in your, in your flat in Brooklyn, it does not taste the same as on the street in Mexico City? So we created a course around that. This meal, though, it just, oh, and obviously we served meringues. Um, this meal was not the end of our Erwar explorations. Um, I think there are a lot of ways to think about this. There's the way Erwar might, the tastes Erwar might contribute to food. There's the taste it takes away, as with Robin Hudson's work. Uh, there's also this idea that cooking creates Erwar. So, uh, you're probably all aware of the problem of uh, cook stoves, particularly in the developing world, where um, you know, up to three billion people are sort of estimated to cook their food on these open fires or simple stoves indoors, burning wood, burning wo animal dung, etc., and generating incredibly high levels of particulate. Um, what's inter oh, there we go. What's interesting is this is not something that we're actually free of in the developed world, too. So while I was at UC Riverside, they, they told me, well, the thing we're now focused on is burger smog. 
Um, Burger smog is a gigantic problem, as it turns out. It's particularly the charbroiled burgers that are very popular in LA, and they had worked out that an 18-wheeler diesel lorry would have to drive 143 miles to put out the same mass of particulates as one charbroiled burger patty, which is quite amazing. So anyway, these, these ideas, I feel like they're just a start. I mean, do we need a smog flavor wheel? Do we need food pairings for particular atmospheric conditions? It, how can air war basically give us new ways to interact with and experience air through food? Um, how does thinking about air war, which is sort of inherently global and borderless, but then also quite it get, forces you to think on a mi microscopic or nearly invisible scale. How, is, how does that offer different insights from something that is more place-based, like terroir? Um, so we made a little introduction to how we're thinking about it. We're now actually, we got a small grant to make a terroir cooking series of videos uh, on YouTube, a little cooking show. Um, <laughs> my hope, though, is that actually it's just a useful idea, not just to us, but to people who could use it to illuminate many, many more things that we haven't thought about and, and, and uh, make the air visible through food. Thank you.